It's a real news network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Whistleblower associated with WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, appeared to be making a statement as he was shuffled out in handcuffs from the Ecuadorian embassy in London. He was carrying a book, a book published by the Real News Network with Gore Vidal on the history of the national security state. We gather Assange may have been trying to send the world a message, as did the Washington Post. And you can find an interview that Paul Jay, the senior editor here at the Real News Network, had done with the Washington Post post in the link below. On to talk about Assange and the reasons for his arrest is a man that is perhaps the most famous whistleblower in history that has experienced this type of arrest and state threats is Daniel Ellsberg, who leaked the famous Pentagon Papers, Daniel's new book, The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. Uh, you will find an interview series re related to Daniel's book here on the Real News Network, and we'll put a link to that as well. Daniel, good to have you here. Glad to be back with you. Thank you. Daniel, uh, your reaction to what has just happened to Julian Assange in London? It's a very serious assault on the First Amendment, a uh, clear attempt to rescind the freedom of the press, essentially. Up till now, we've had a dozen or so indictments of sources, of which my prosecution was the very first prosecution of an American for disclosing information to the American public. And that was ended a couple of years later by governmental misconduct. There were two others before President Obama and nine or so under President Obama of sources, none of these having been tested in the Supreme Court yet as to their relation to the First Amendment hasn't gone to them. This is the first uh, indictment of a journalist, an editor or publisher, Julian Assange, and if it's successful, it will not be the last. This clearly is a part of President Trump's war on the press, what he calls the enemy of the state. And um, if uh, he succeeds in putting Julian Assange in prison, where I think he'll be for life if he goes there at all, uh, probably the first, first charge against him is only a few years, but that's probably just the first of many. In my own case, my first indictment was for three counts, felony counts. My, uh, that was later expanded to 12 felony counts by the end of the year for a possible 115-year sentence. So I think this is a warning, a shot across uh, the bow of every editor and publisher in the country. Uh, if... Uh, they make the connection of the Real News Network book that he was carrying with him into prison, which I think Gore Vidal would be very pleased uh, to see him associated with this incident in terms of uh, defending Julian Assange's rights. But uh, they may connect you. You may be in the next conspiracy trial with Julian Assange. It may not take much more than that. I, know, I see on the indictment, which I've just read, that one of the charges is that he encouraged Chelsea Manning, then Bradley Manning, to give him documents, more documents, after she had already given him hundreds of thousands of files. Well, if that's a crime, then journalism is a crime, because just on countless occasions, I have been asked by journalists for documents or for more documents than I had yet given them. So uh, they, none of them have been put on trial up till now. But in this case, if that's all it takes, then uh, no journalist is safe. The freedom of the press is not safe, it's over. And I think our republic is in its last days because unauthorized disclosures of this kind are the life's blood of a republic. Daniel, thank you for connecting that Chelsea Manning is currently sitting in prison. And uh, after uh, 28 days in solitary confinement for not cooperating and answering the questions related to the Julian Assange case um, and the grand jury uh, investigation that is underway. Now, um, it is uh, very interesting that um, uh, uh, President Moreno of Ecuador um, withdrew the asylum 
uh, that uh, was protecting Julian Assange until today uh, in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, which led to all of this. And uh, Jen Robin Robinson, who is Julian Assange, one of his lawyers tweeted as he was being arrested that um, she wanted to confirm that Assange had been arrested not just for breach of bail conditions, but also in relation to the U.S. Um, extradition request. Now, in your assessment of having undergone this kind of uh, uh, ex uh, allegations and arrests and uh, being under this kind of scrutiny by the state, uh, what do you think the real intentions here is of the United States in forcing uh, this uh, uh, revocation of his asylum uh, from the Ecuadorian embassy as well as this uh, request for extradition? You know, I think the word forcing may be misleading here because it it um, underrates the degree of choice here that Ecuador and the British had in both these cases, and for that matter, the Department of Justice. But uh, they couldn't really force Ecuador to break the norm of international asylum here by handing them over. They couldn't force Britain. Obviously, both of those were induced by various incentives. My guess would be in the case of Moreno, that he's involved in uh, debt relief. And uh, the U.S., uh, the great creditor nation here, although it's actually a debtor nation in, uh, in altogether, but uh, they're enabled to bring the kind of pressure on Ecuador that caused essentially a lawless action here, uh, which threatens everyone in asylum, everyone in the world, uh, in the people in this country who have been granted political asylum, people in Britain, and certainly in Ecuador. So uh, that's, that's very ominous. Uh, the British have uh, had a long history here of uh, servility, basically, with respect to their ally, the United States, and again, are not too concerned, I think, about law. There was an earlier indication that uh, Ecuador might uh, find an assurance from Britain that Assange was not facing a death penalty as sufficient excuse for uh, revoking his asylum on the grounds that they had really only given asylum uh, because of fear of the death penalty. I think that's absurd. Uh, I think there was no mention of that seven years ago when we got the asylum. And of course, you don't have to be facing a death penalty to be seeking and being granted political asylum. So why exactly this moment is chosen for uh, Ecuador and Britain to uh, truckle to the United States I'm not sure. I noticed that the indictment was signed a year ago in March 2018. Maybe they've, uh, the price has been haggling uh, between Ecuador and Britain as to what the price would be for handing him over. Uh, as I say, though, it's a threat not only to journalists, but to people in political status, in political asylum everywhere. But the immediate threat, if you say the significance of this for Trump, I have no doubt that he wants to define criminally in a courtroom the press as a, an enemy of the people. When I say that Assange seeking documents, something that I've been asked countless times by a journalist uh, to do, uh, to give them documents, if that's all it takes, then the First Amendment means very little. And without freedom of the press, um, you have no, you have very little freedom in the country. I'm afraid that's the direction we're going. So journalists in general, I think, should uh, rally around this case, whatever they think of Julian himself. There's a lot of people who don't like Julian personally. I am not one of those. I do like him. Uh, there's a lot of people who are very critical of his actions in the election in 2016 on various grounds. Uh, I'm not happy with the result to the extent that it in any way aided President Trump to become president. And... Uh, Trump uh, did, of course, uh, plight his love for Julian at one point. He said, I love WikiLeaks when it seemed to be helping him in the... But of course, uh, a promise of love from Donald Trump is uh, not terribly reliable. We knew that already. So uh, he's willing to uh, make him the sacrificial goat here, I think, for journalists in general.
Now, Danielle, you said something very interesting, uh, which is the, all those who are interested in uh, press freedom um, and, of course, defending our right to freedom of expression and access to information and knowledge um, that uh, is critical for a democracy. You, in this situation, was also assisted by various people uh, on the outside. What are some of the pivotal uh, things that happened uh, in your case that might be a lesson for us today? Well, something that was striking to me was that uh, a dozen or so people helped my wife and I, Patricia and I, who's my, Patricia's my unindicted co-conspirator here now, and a number of people helped us find lodging uh, in while we were looting the FBI, putting out 17 different uh, version of the parts of the Pentagon Papers, the different newspapers, to keep the story going after the Times and the Post had both been enjoined for the first time in our history. And none of those people was ever questioned by the FBI because we stayed off the phone, basically, and which at that time kind of paralyzed them in the days before computers. In those days, pay phones were relatively safe. I don't think that's true anymore if there are still pay phones, as a matter of fact. But um, uh, what struck me was that when I uh, finally wrote an account of that many years later in the uh, first, about 2002, uh, 30 years later, I had hoped to tell the story of all these other people 30 years later as part of the story. I thought it had never gotten out into the news and it would be interesting to people how they had helped us in that in uh, carrying the papers to different newspapers and communicating with them and finding us places to stay. In those days, it was quite easy to find people. They just had to be young, basically, with long hair, men or women, and said, there's something you could do here that might help shorten this war, but it might have a lot of legal risk. No one refused. However, 30 years later, not one was willing to let their name be used because that was a time when John Ashcroft uh, our previous Confederate Attorney General uh, before Sessions was uh, the Attorney General. And uh, they were afraid in one case of deportation, other cases of indictment, even as late as that. Now, just a couple of years ago, one of the, a key person in that process, Gar Alperovitz, uh, did, after consulting his lawyers, decide to let me use his name. And that, there was a New Yorker story about that recently. But others, still cautious. And what it appears now is, I think they were right uh, to be cautious about that. I would have thought, with all this time having elapsed, uh, that could be, and with it having been clear that the publication they'd aided in had served the American interests in helping end the Vietnam War and in exposing a lot of lying, I would have thought that they, uh, they would be not only proud of that, which I think they are, but uh, willing to take credit for that. Nope. That's a credit they didn't want because it may come at the cost of an indictment. And uh, I hope Carr is not caught up in that at this point. But um, the conspiracy charge, I, I don't know if, uh, if, if uh, there's a conspiracy charge in this case yet, since Chelsea Manning, uh, who uh, gave uh, Julian the, the material, has served seven and a half years in prison and is in prison again right now apparently because they want her to go beyond what she said, uh, either falsely, uh, which they would be happy with to incriminate Julian Assange. After all, torture uh, is mainly used for false confessions to get them, and it's usually successful at that, but not successful with Chelsea Manning. She was in solitary confinement for 10 and a half months until public pressure got her released into the general prison population years ago. And clearly, she's not being a person who can be tortured into a false confession. Uh, or they would want her to give new details of her dealings with Assange that would help them in their prosecution of Assange. And she is not cooperating with the grand jury on that, which she objects to the grand jury as an undemocratic, uh, unconstitutional, really, but un undemocratic process in its secrecy, its lack of legal defense legal support in that process, and many people over the years have, have uh, res resisted that. As a matter of fact, my co-defendant, Tony Russo, 
uh, refused to testify to the grand jury before uh, after I was indicted, but before the new indictment. And he spent about a month in, in jail before he himself was indicted and added to the indictment. So that's a precedent for what Chelsea Manning is doing now. He didn't want to be testifying against me in secret to a grand jury, no transcript of the proceedings, no publicity as to what he may have been said. In fact, he offered to testify if he was given a transcript that he could publish of his testimony, and they refused to do that and uh, indicted him himself. I say again, that was Anthony Russo, who's uh, no longer alive. But uh, Chelsea is doing that right now. She's acting very courageously again, I would say, uh, which is not something I would ever demand of anyone, but uh, I'm not at all surprised that she is doing that. All right, Danielle, any last thoughts you have uh, on this case, and particularly if uh, Julian Assange gets charged with espionage on top of all of this? Uh, I am doubtful that, um, but what do I know? My judgment is not worth much here, and it's a, it's a fairly unprecedented case. In fact, totally unprecedented when we're talking about extraditing him for committing journalism. Uh, they do charge him with um, aiding or trying to aid uh, Chelsea to conceal her identity on the leaks here. That's something that the Freedom of the Press Foundation, in a different way, uh, and I'm a board on the board of that, along with Ed Snowden and Laura Poitras and others, uh, we've given out uh, software to many journalist associations uh, to enable people to give them information secretly in cipher, to encipher it. That's, that's a little different from what he's charged with here, but to the same effect of concealing the source. Incidentally, Chelsea told me that she intended to reveal herself eventually here to prevent other people from being wrongly accused. That was true of me and true of Ed Snowden as well, that we didn't want other people to be accused of doing what we alone had done here. So I do think that uh, having induced the British to arrest him forcibly, as just happened, uh, indicates that they will go the extra mile in uh, violating, as I say, international norms by uh, violating his immunity and his asylum and then shipping off to the U.S. Uh, in my day, his case would have been almost sure to be upheld by this, that is, uh, the case dismissed by the Supreme Court on grounds of violating the First Amendment. But that was a different Supreme Court 40 years ago. And this court, I don't think at all he could count on to defend the Supreme Court or much else in the Bill of Rights. I think uh, a great deal is at risk nowadays, especially with the uh, last couple of appointments that Trump has made. So, but before that as well. So it's a very ominous situation, not only for Julian Assange, who's been in one room for almost seven years now. Um, something I suspect, by the way, has affected his judgment in some respects. I don't, I don't endorse every choice he's made uh, or in the last couple of years in particular. I don't know what kind of judgment I'd be showing after six years in one room. I think he has ahead of him for having taken on the world's mightiest empire and exposed its criminal secrets in many cases, having to do with torture and assassination. He's not going to get any breaks from them. I think he'll be in one room possibly in solitary confinement on the excuse that he has further secrets that he might reveal, uh, just as Ed Snowden would face that, I think, possibly for the rest of his life. And that will certainly be far, far more onerous than the uh, room he's had in the Ecuadorian embassy, which already was amounted to uh, inhumane treatment and uh, wrongful imprisonment. Well, the solitary he's heading for now is much more serious. I did notice, by the way, that uh, he was being dragged down the steps. Uh, I've been arrested many times, and I have a bad back myself. I always walk when I get arrested uh, to spare the backs of uh, the police arresting me. Uh, but I think if I were being arrested under these circumstances, with the Constitution at stake here, being absolutely wrongfully arrested, 
uh, I wouldn't worry about the backs. I would do what um, Julian was apparently doing, and that was, uh, you're going to have to drag me into prison. Yeah, resisting. Uh, Danielle, great to have you on this uh, very significant day that exposes the hand of the state that threatens our freedom of expression. Thank you so much. It's a day for journalists in general, especially and everybody who values a free press, and not only in this country, uh, to join ranks here now to expose and resist the wrongful and in this country unconstitutional abuse of our laws uh, to silence journalists. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he is further indicted under the Espionage Act, as I was the first person to do that. I suspect that'll be added to his charges. And again, that's a great danger to journalists general. They have to inform themselves on it and begin to demand that the Espionage Act not be used uh, against the free press as it has been under the last two presidents. Danielle, great to have you here. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.